Okay, so uh, that's the title. So I like threat modeling. Cannot lie. Uh, as said, I am a senior staff engineer at Datadog right now. I'm focusing on their new line of uh, security products. But for a long time before that, I was doing broad security in all sorts of places. And the list there, actually I can't look here, it's not up there to establish my alpha geekiness credentials. Uh, it is here just to show the different sizes and kinds of places where I've been doing security for the past Lord knows how many years. Too many to count. And uh, it started my, my thing with threat modeling, at least the, the pop, my out thing with, with threat modeling started when I started writing all kinds of papers and training for places like uh, Safe Code, if you are familiar with, or the uh, IEEE Center for uh, Secure Design. And uh, here and there I found myself talking about this threat modeling thing, but how did I start the whole thing? It was in 2010, I think, when I started at uh, the EMC, and my boss at the time, uh, Rini uh, Sondi, she basically gave me a challenge. She wanted me to create threat modeling as a service part for the product security office there. And uh, the way that this worked is Dell at the time had a huge line of products and the product security office was responsible for giving a security consulting to each one of those. And these products were like all over the place. Most of them were focused on uh, uh, backups, but some of them were Linux based, some of them were on Windows, some of them were character level, some of them were block level, it could be anything. And that challenge to come up with a way for everybody to be able to threat model and to use the small number of people that we had in the product security office drove me to the conclusion that uh, no, that, that wasn't the right way of doing it. It uh, took me a couple of years, but uh, the conclusions are going to, th this is basically the conclusions that I came to. So I'm also the co-author of the Threat Modeling Practical Guide for Development Teams with uh, Matthew Coles. Uh, actually, at the end for the Q&A, the, uh, the best question of the evening, afternoon, of the afternoon, uh, gets a free copy. So prepare your hands to go up. I am a very proud co-author of the Threat Modeling Manifesto. And also, lately, co-host of the Security Table podcast, where um, we freely talk about a bunch of security stuff for people, for friends, and uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. So if you want to add one more podcast to your list, try us. And uh, I am also the lead developer for OWASP ITM, one of the, uh, actually, the threat modeling with code tool that you can find out there. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you put it on, it on uh, twice the speed, my accent gets much funnier. So I really recommend that. Opinions, and I have many, are mine. My uh, employers do not uh, pay for them. By the end of this talk, the things that I am hoping that you're going to take with you, you're going to hear uh, what I think are some of the important parts of creating a threat modeling program wherever you are and whatever side, uh, size you are and uh, how these things can break. And you're going to have some pointers on how to create your own, grow your own program wherever you are. And I think that most important of all, you, you're going to have something to measure. Now, <clears throat> one word of care, caution, there are many talks about how to create threat modeling programs and they are all great, the ones that I saw at least. This is mine. It doesn't mean that this is the way to do it. It doesn't mean that it is the right way of doing it. But to me, what it means is that I went back to all those years of notes and experiences and things that I tried and things that I failed and things that I actually succeeded. And I figured out some common denominators that I could bring in and say, okay, this is the way for me. What I hope is that it's generic enough and that it's applicable enough that people can get some value out of it. So just in case you were here before and uh, I started talking and now you don't feel like leaving or you're too shy for that, what is this threat modeling thing that we're talking about? 
According to the Threat Modeling Manifesto, and if you haven't read it and you are interested in uh, threat modeling, I would say that there's a small hole in your education, so go for it. One of the important things that we came out with was a definition for what is this threat modeling thing. We noticed that for a long time people have been talking about threat modeling, and I mean a long time, it's by no means a new thing. But no two people were talking about exactly the same thing. So we came up with this definition, which is one, not the, but it's a workable one, where threat modeling is analyzing representations of a system to highlight concerns about its security and privacy characteristics. Now, one parenthesis. <laughs> one of the worst things about being one of the last talks in a conference like this is that you have had so many good talks before that already said so many important things that it's hard to feel like you're not repeating what they said. So we've had some talks about threat modeling here. We had one very good keynote on uh, uh, threat modeling and privacy. And uh, I will come back to some things that were said, but uh, trying to put it in, in light of how you apply them. Now, very important, I'm not going to talk about how to threat model. That's a separate thing. I am trying to go up one or two levels and say, okay, you got your methodology, you figured out how to threat model now, how do you get this thing to actually work at scale in an organization, different teams, different cultures, and all that. <clears throat> it seems that we, we are very much in the rhythm of talking about journeys. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about mine and explain how I got here meaning why do I feel like I can talk about this stuff? And as I said, it started with the challenge at, uh, at EMC, how to get those uh, different teams being able to threat model at some level. And in 2018, I presented at Epsakali something called the best flaw didn't make into, into production. And at the time I related to it as a, a talk, but actually it was a rant. I was very, very frustrated at that time. And that rant sort of focused mostly on how we were training people and the things that we were expecting from developers and how throwing the threat modeling load on top of them was just one more expectation, something else that we were asking of them, but we were not giving them the knowledge and the equipment to do. And uh, that turned into, uh, okay, so what can I do at the developer level? Which brought me to Threat Model Every Story, which was my contribution in terms of a methodology that I don't have to rely on security champions and I don't have to rely on tools, I don't have to rely on somebody that is an expert in threat modeling, but I can actually put in front of every single developer and tell them, hey, you got a new story, Consider it in terms of the security, threat model, just that story, update whatever threat model you have, move on, next. Which then led to, what do you mean threat model every story? Because people looked at me and said, you're crazy. You're asking us to do this whole big threat modeling thing on every story. And uh, of course that's when you come and you explain that no, there is this continuous threat modeling methodology and it's based on uh, checklists, small checklists that are written in developer language, so you don't have to do this whole song and dance for every, every single thing, but uh, it was applicable. And then, of course, when you come and you offer methodology and you offer a new way of doing things, and in the environment that we live, the next question is, but how does it scale? Every time that I say this, I, I get reminded of the uh, commercial Will It Blend, I think something like that, that the guy would put all kinds of things on the blender and just press the button. So the, the question is always, will it scale? And that led to that presentation at Epsec Cali, where we presented the results at, of trying continuous threat modeling at a number of different teams at Autodesk. And uh, the distinction there is that those teams were not chosen randomly. They were located in different places in the world. They were different uh, cultures, they were different languages, and they were different program, uh, development environments. So that was trying to say, yeah, the thing works, 
and you actually can scale it up. You can have a very small security team and still support this thing. Then we came up with DFDs ain't that bad at uh, DEF CON, the, the AppSec Village. I think it was the first one, actually. No, the second one. And uh, I presented there with, uh, with Matt on uh, why is it that people have this difficulty with uh, creating all the, 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 the stuff that we need to be able to do a good threat model. So people come and say, no, I'm not going to stop now my development and create all these strange diagrams that you want, especially because I already have some architectural diagram and whatnot. But the important thing in this talk was that there is a lot of other information that you can get from a threat model that's going to contribute to other areas of your SDLC, right? So there's a lot of ancillary value that you can extract from the process of threat modeling that's going to help you in other uh, efforts that you have. And at the end, most uh, uh, recently, there was a presentation on how all this stuff breaks because it's not enough to come and say, hey, you know what, do this thing and it's gonna be great and ignore the fact that sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's really frustrating. The good thing is that when it breaks, apparently, there are also enough uh, common denominators that let us say it broke because of this. This is the thing that I can do differently and get a different, a better result later on. So this is my journey that got me to a point where I think that I can step away from this is how you threat model to let's get this place threat modeling together and uh, uh, basically create a, a threat modeling program or my version of one. So what is a program? Once upon a time, we called computer code a program and it wasn't just by chance, right? It's not coincidence. It's basically a sequence of well-defined steps leading to an expected outcome. <laughs> you, you actually hope that it's deterministic and that every time that you run it, you're going to get the same thing. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, so it's funny like that. Most importantly, a program is a process of processes. Saying I have a threat modeling program is not just saying my people do threat model. I have to have something on top of that and some other auxiliary things that we're going to talk about that actually help build that body of knowledge that a threat model uh, represents. So I went to program managers, people who do this for a, a living, and I asked, hey, if I want to define a new program, right, doesn't matter what, what is it that I need to have in place? What is it that leads me to say this is a valid program, something that people can use, something that people can, uh, can do? First of all, you have to have well-defined goals. You have to have well-defined responsibilities and actions. People have to know who's going to do what in order to achieve what else. The outcomes have to be reproducible and tweakable, meaning you have to be able to hack those things, change those variables that you can identify so that you can get better over time. And you have to be able to debrief. That's something that people many times ignore. They fire and forget. You have to spend the time debriefing and understanding what just happened here. Right? Again, in order to get better. I think personally that if we boil all those things down, it's basically, there's a list of things that need to happen. There's a list of people who have to make these things happen. And the important thing here is that every time that it happens, we make it better than last time. Now, when I was flying over here, I was looking for, you know, smart quotes to justify programs and stuff like this. And in one of those Wikipedia expeditions, I ended up with this one. Just a disclaimer. It sounds like I'm talking about automation. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations we can perform without thinking about them. The quote is from uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who was a mathematician and philosopher and co-author, and I had no clue, of the Principia Mathematica, one of the most uh, important books ever in mathematical logic. And uh, what I liked in here is that, as you saw in my presentation, who I am slide, I like the co-dash something, co-host, co-author, collaborator. 
part of this whole thing for me, part of the interest in threat modeling in these processes for me, is that it's a great opportunity to put your ideas out with a lot of people who are interested in the same things as you, have them tested, have them discussed, and everybody learns in the end. So that, that's what, what made me focus on this quote specifically. And if you take it into the context of creating a program, what it means to me is that basically, once we get this sequence of operations pat down, once we get this thing codified and everybody knows what they have to do, what they have to achieve, then we are free to start doing more interesting things. So creating that program is not important only because you need a threat modeling program. Somebody wrote somewhere that you have to have a checkbox. But because having it in place, it's going to free you to do all the other interesting things, all the other shiny things that you want to do instead of being dealing with that. I mentioned a couple of times that I like to talk about the things that break, and I think that it's important to start this talk specifically saying what are the challenges, what are the big things that we have to overcome in order to have this program work. The first one is that wherever you are, and I'm willing to put money down, your environment is changing all the time. It's very, very rare today, whatever place of work where uh, there isn't a new thing, there isn't a new pool, the uh, business plans are not changing or the, the constraints are changing or whatever, and we have to deal with that. So the most important, one of the most important things in this program is that it has to be flexible to tend to, 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 to work with all those changes that happen all the time. Developers are a very, very funny bunch. They, yeah, they don't like security. Because security, again, takes them away from all the shiny things that they do like. This stuff takes time. This stuff is hard. This morning, Tanya correctly pointed out that developers are very smart people. And that's great. That's also very not great. Because smart people are not good at being told what to do. Smart people like to discuss things that they should be doing, but they don't like to be told, do this, right? So many times you, you're going to ask them, you're going to propose to them to do this threat modeling thing, and rather than see it as an intellectual challenge as they should, they're going to see it as one more burden, one more thing that they have to do, instead of doing those intellectual challenges that they actually like. On the other hand, management wants coders to code, right? We, <laughs> most people are not paid to put out threat models. They are paid to put out code that actually functions and, and has a business use and brings money to the company. So managers many times will say, you're just wasting my time. I don't need you doing this thing. Stop talking to my people, go away. Another thing is, apparently there aren't enough security people around. Big discussion, but facts are, our security teams are mostly never as big as we would like them to be to deal with the whole load of development happening under them. In other words, you never have enough people to read threat models, to read code, to test stuff. Nowadays, everything must be automated. No code, S code, what's code, whatever, right? There is this pressure that if you put a program in place, it not be a people program. It has to be something automated. It has to be something that you press a button, goes into this CI/CD thing, comes out to the other side, everything looks amazing. But at some point, we have to deal with the fact that threat modeling is a conceptual process, right? We are asking, what could possibly go wrong? And if you can take that already from the artifacts that you have that could be automated, then you probably at some point already knew everything that could go wrong. It sounds strange, but if you think about it, there is a component here that the human, even though what we just heard in the last keynote, the human will ne mostly never be out of the loop. If you can codify things to the point that an automated process can scan and figure out what is it that you're doing, then there will always be another level of challenges that the thing won't see. <clears throat> and tools galore. Nowadays, people are very uh, fond of saying, I don't need a program, I got a tool. You go out and you buy a tool that does something, and that becomes your program, right? You don't need to, to manage the loops, you don't need to learn stuff, you need to 
enter your input, get the output, mark the checkbox, move forward. We're going to talk a bit more about tools, but uh, sometimes having too many tools is a, is a problem. So, okay, so we, we know where it can fail. Now, where do we begin? At this time, we don't have anything that can be called a threat modeling maturity model. In some ways, that's good. In some ways, that's not so good. But a maturity model is a great place to lead you through developing your own program. Why? Because it tells you, it tells you where you are, and it tells you where you should be. Where you should be, in the opinion of a lot of people who were at some point where you are, and managed to be in a better place. One great reference for us is this little thing called the OpenSAM, which I guess most of you are familiar by, uh, with by now. And uh, in the uh, threat assessment track, they offer the three maturity levels that are related to uh, threat model. And I'm not going to read everything because I have a nice drawing. So if you're in level one, you are doing best effort threat modeling. Whatever you do, whatever you call threat modeling, you're talking about it in lunchtime, that's cool, you're in level one. Things start getting a bit more formalized and a bit more um, <clears throat> uh, technical. When you go to level two, and you are doing the loop where you train people, you execute, and you mitigate what you found. And then you go back to train people because you just learned something on the mitigation part, so get that knowledge, push it to people again, hey guys, new thing, don't do the same mistake again, great, let's do it again. That's level two. Level three adds us automation and scale. And this drawing is basically my interpretation of the maturity model. It's nothing official. The only thing here is that I'm pointing where I think that things happen with some logical connection. So you can scale the automation, you can scale the execution, you can scale the training of people. At the same time, you can automate a lot of the stuff that you are trying to scale, but not all arrows go to all bubbles at the same time. There is a logic to the madness. And then, if you want to leave and uh, to move beyond level three, which is sort of what I'm proposing today, you add another piece, which is the measurement, right? You go back, you figure out what you did there, and uh, you decide what you're going to change for the next, next round. You decide what the les lessons learned are, and you go there. Sounds very easy when you talk about it, right? But again, the dragons are where they are, and you have to deal with that. And these are the things that I found ha uh, help in each one of those uh, different activities. So first of all, in order to learn lessons, you have to be able to measure stuff. And yesterday we had the, the talk with uh, uh, Sarah Jane, I believe, and she had this great analogy on uh, measuring the invisible man that I found super appropriate and, and I'm going to be borrowing. But the question is, if you have a threat modeling program, what is it that you can measure? Okay? The number of threats identified immediately jumps, right? I'm doing threat models, I'm identifying new stuff. Cool, I have a number, I can measure that. Of course, the number of threats mitigated, that's not a great number, because it shows how fast my people are fixing stuff that I found, right? No. Because you, you can't know how many findings there are that you haven't identified. So you're basically not measuring anything. You're measuring a portion of a value that's unknown to you. So what has that added to you? Same thing with mitigation. Perhaps you have a lot of business factors that don't let you go back and you have to accept that risk. So you haven't really mitigated anything. The things that you can measure, first of all, it's the percent of developers that are trained in security. Notice I have not said trained in threat modeling. You can train a lot of people to ask a lot of questions, but you want them to ask the right questions. So the focus of the training here is not training my people in how to do threat modeling, but training them in the fundamentals of security. I want people to be able to look at their systems from a point of view that's more critical of the security that's not in there than 
am I using the right methodology for threat modeling? Another thing is the uh, percent of the attack surface or the number of systems or the number of interesting stuff that you have around. Because we, we always say, you can't defend what you don't know, right? So the first step is to map, what's my attack surface? What, what are the things that I'm trying to defend? And now if you have to measure something, measure the amount of those things that you are looking at with that critical security eye. And the last one that I personally like the most, and this is a, something that came straight from the threat modeling manifesto. I'm going to repeat this a number of times today. If your threat model does not bring value, if the people who are supposed to be educated by your threat model do not recognize value in the activity of creating that threat model, stop, you're doing something wrong. So by getting from these customers the measure of their satisfaction with the process, these are the people who are actually doing the threat models and dealing with the results. If they are not coming back to you and saying, you know what, this was a good exercise, I learned something, I'm able to see different things now, then you have to change something. So, train everybody on what exactly? I already said a bit, not on threat modeling, more on security fundamentals. But you can't give a threat modeling talk without mentioning the four questions, right? And the four questions are, Adam Shostak's four questions, of course, what are we building? What could go wrong? What are we going to do about it? Did we do a good job? So when you're training people, they have to be able to first model the target system. We many times forget that threat modeling is a two-part process. It's modeling the system and then eliciting the threats. If you have, if you are unable to threat the thing that you are, until model the thing that you are talking about, chances are that it's going to be very hard for you to find the appropriate threats. So people have to be able to explain what is it that they're working on? What is it that they're building? Then they have to understand, explain, and or imagine. And think about it, these are three very different processes for a person to go through. What could possibly go wrong? It's not enough to say, this thing could break. If you want to eventually fix it, you have to be able to come in and say the ways that it's going to break. You have to understand the ways that, that it could break, and you possibly have to be able to explain to someone else how those things break. And this brings us to developers having a level of uh, detail in the things that they're building that is not part of other processes of development. What I mean is that a developer will get a spec, a story, a design, something that they have to implement, and usually they will know that part very well, but they will know that part. The moment that we use threat modeling methodologies that enforce the, uh, the idea of bringing everybody together to discuss the system, you are automatically raising the level of knowledge of that system of every single person participating in that exercise. Then they have to be able to decide what to do about it. It's not enough to see how the things break. They have to see how they can fix those things in the context of the system that they are building. There isn't one single solution for every single problem out there. Sometimes you have to change the things that you are able to do to adapt yourself to the realities of the system. Could be a business constraint, could be a time constraint, money, whatever. But uh, it's very easy to come up with checklists and say, oh, if you have a, a, an injection problem that you need to sanitize input. Sometimes you have to do something else. But people have to be trained to see those possibilities in the constraints that they live under. And at the end, they have to recognize how successful the effort was, which goes back to the point of, does this have value to you? If you are participating in a threat modeling and you come out feeling that your time was wasted, that you haven't learned anything, that uh, you don't understand what just happened, and unfortunately, I've seen this many times, then something is wrong in there. So this goes back to that presentation from 2018, the best flaw didn't make into production, and uh, of course, it's in the tube. Remember, twice speed, twice as funny the accent. <clears throat> then we get to the execute part. And that's the fun part, right? That, that, that's what we like to do. 
to actually get into a room, talk to people, draw into whiteboards, all that good stuff. And the problem is that now you are not the security person doing the threat model. Now you are the program person trying to get everybody to do some sort of threat modeling and extract some big value for the organization. Not only for you as a security person, not only for the team or teams that you are responsible for, but for the whole thing. You, you are looking for some interconnectedness that wasn't there before. So the first thing is you have to understand what is it that you're threat modeling, right? Sometimes you, most times, you won't be able to do everything. You will not want to do everything. And sometimes you won't need to do everything. So you have to be able to actually scope those things where your effort is going to have the most impact or those things that actually need your effort. Then you have to understand, okay, how much, remember the measurement that I offered before, how much of the total of the things that I need to actually do something about, not the total universe of the things that you have, does this represent? So this scope that I just found, in the grand scheme of things, how much of it, how much it reduces my attack surface if I solve all the findings that I identify here? Then you get to the really fun part, which is to get people to do threat modeling. And here, <laughs> under the bold, I'm hiding years and years and years of experiences of trying to have people use different uh, ways of threat modeling, different methodologies. Some people will love Stride, some people will use Pasta, some people will do Atasm and whatnot, right? We have, I don't remember how many methodologies at last count, but we are not shy in the number. And to tell you the truth, nothing stops you from creating your own. If you figure out something that works for you and that your people are ready to work with and that they feel that gives them value, go for it. Okay, you don't have to be bound to use anything that has been blessed by any council or something. Just figure out what is it that brings you value. And do it. That's the important part. Actually get people to do it. Then comes the part of, okay, I got some findings. Now what do I do with them? And this is a funny bit because you could make it part of your program to actually validate them, or you could not. You could just say having the findings is enough for me. I don't need to go and have each one of them separately figured out by somebody else. It could be part of the loop of the team itself. They could do their own validation. Depends, works for you, you do it. Doesn't work for you, at least you have the findings. Then get everything in one place. And uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a bit about that one. Funny thing about threat models, it's not clear for some people what to do with the results. And they could disappear, they could be used, they, many things could happen with them, but eventually if you want something good to happen out of this whole organizational thing, you have to get your results in one place where people are going to find them. And then you have to get people to act on the results. Findings are called findings because they were found. Now, somebody better do something with them because otherwise they will be found again and again and again. And eventually they'll be found by people who you don't want to find them. And that goes to the, what do you mean, threat model every story, where I go over these, uh, these details in, uh, in a finer grain. Scale. So that goes back to the heart of why do you need a program? And this is usually where things start hurting. Because that's where the difference between organizations and the difference between cultures and the difference between approaches starts showing more and more. Sometimes you create this perfect thing that works in one bit of your company, across the street, different office, different team, doesn't work. So what do we need in order to scale? We need a process. Otherwise, you don't know what you're scaling. You're just doing more things. But if you have a process in place, at least when you say this scales 10 times, you're, you know what you are multiplying by 10. The problem is that what's so difficult to figure in a process, how is it going to scale? So we get caught in that thing of, I think that I can do things this way because I think that they will scale, and they will scale because I'm doing them this way. 
trial and error, understanding your culture, understanding your people, and understanding the differences between your people all over your organization. My personal bias, opinion, idea, experience, whatever, is that you can only depend on that training. Whatever process you put in place, whatever scale you try to apply to that process, it's going to come only based on the quality of your training. And notice that <laughs> I'm not just saying perfunctory training, training for the sake of uh, 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 compliance or just one more checkbox. This is the training that you actually want people to use. So when you are choosing your training, choose well. Because this is that time that you're going to take away from the developers, that if they feel that you are getting it and not giving them any value back, you will not, not have it back. They will not, next year, they will not come back for more. So when you choose training, choose well. To me, it is the main predictor of uh, scalability in this specific case. And yes, that's a strong assertion. Parking lot for P, well, not for PM now, but uh, after this, willing to fight for it. <clears throat> this goes to the scaling up is hard to do, where I go up uh, how we chose training, what kind of training we're giving, all that good stuff in more detail. And then after you got the whole thing, right, you have to find a nice drawer to file the threat model. Actually, okay, you, you now have to mitigate those findings. So after you did all this effort, you're going to let people just do whatever with the results? No, right? You're going to ask them, hey, do you get any value from this? And if they start telling you, no, I didn't get any, then you might have a case of security theory. And people are just going through the motions just to get, sorry, to get you off their backs. It's time to step back, reassess, review, see what is it that we as security people are doing wrong. And believe you me, we do plenty of stuff wrong. And then go back from a different angle, with a different speed, with a different set of requests. Very important, let people know that this is happening. Don't let things live in a vacuum. If you find something interesting that might apply in a different place of your organization that perhaps wasn't threat model or that was and that thing didn't surface there, let people know. Let people know that there is some reason for root cause analysis. We do the same thing in different places in the system and we only identified it as a threat here. So what's happening over here, right? Take advantage of the effort in one part of the organization to feed the effort in other places. Places that are not moving at the speed that you need, and notice the use of the verb need, not the speed that you want, the speed that you need. There's a huge difference here. We as security people, sometimes we tend to make things more urgent than they actually need to be. And we say, I want you to do this. I need you to do this. There's a difference between both of them. So we have to learn as professionals to make the distinction and ask, ask people to do things the way that we need them to do, not the way that we want them to do. Even though sometimes for us, it's very hard to make the distinction between both of them. And use the findings, use the process, use the, uh, attachment of people to that process to give them visibility. Somebody did a good job, let people know. Okay? Again, I'm going to refer to uh, uh, Tanya's keynote this morning, the importance of letting people feel rewarded by the effort that they're putting in there. The thing is that now you have something that's actually uh, uh, tangible to hold in your hand and say, hey, this person helped find this threat, which could have a huge impact but because we caught it early enough, we're not even going to have to check for bad code, check for vulnerabilities later on. We can change the design and solve this much cheaper than at the end of the, uh, the process. And understand that whenever you have findings, again, the wants versus needs, people are not going to jump and just start closing findings just because you feel like. 
you will have to find a way to incorporate these things into the medium and long-term plans of whatever is it that you're working on. Tools. Where are we going? We don't need tools. No, actually we do. Now, one important dist uh, distinction that I'm going to make, I am not talking only about threat modeling tools, even though I literally wear one. Threat modeling tools are great, and they do awesome things for the process. But sometimes they dictate the way that you are going to go to the process. My personal experience, whenever you have a tool that starts telling people how to do things, it's a tool that perhaps you should reevaluate. You should be using the right tool for your job. This is already hard enough to do without having somebody trying to imprint a certain behavior on you that you didn't choose to take. There are no silver bullets. There is no one single tool, and I believe there will, it will be very hard to ever have one that you simply click on a button, threat model pops up, everybody's happy. Not gonna happen. There are some very good tools out there that have nothing to do with threat modeling. But they are great at helping you in that situation that I believe most of you have some point found yourselves of coming and asking, okay, can you tell me what's happening here? What, what, what is this system? What are the services? What's the topology? Where are things running? Who's responsible for what? And people look at you and, <laughs> uh, yeah, it works. And nobody knows how. So there are some tools over the, uh, around the, uh, around the ecosystem that will help you map these things and figure them out, even in a place where the developers themselves, for reasons of whatever, the person who wrote part of the, the thing is not there anymore. Even in those situations where they don't know what they have under their responsibility, there are tools that will help you map these things out. Observability tools, uh, uh, administration tools, don't discount those. Those are good inputs. Put them, make them part of your tool set. Use everyday tools for the boring parts. And that is, not every single tool has to be shiny and exotic. You can use, you know, everyday stuff from VI to CAT to whatever to help you automate those boring parts of the system that you will need to apply in your uh, threat modeling effort. Use whatever tool comes in. Don't, don't, don't be, uh, don't be a, a tool snob. You can use them for saving and for sharing threat models, which sometimes is a, a bit of a, a chore, especially when you have an organization where people develop in different uh, environments and not every tool is available for everybody. Use the ones that work. You can use and you should use them for templates and diagrams, especially I, I'm, I'm very fond of uh, diagrams as code. And uh, there are some great tools out there presenting in different styles, different ways of uh, dealing with them. I recommend you to, to use those. And use tools for low-hanging fruit. There is, we, we, we are at an age that enough stuff has been hard-coded into the way that we do things, the ways you, you deploy things to the cloud, the way you compile things, the way you pull dependencies, whatever that you don't have to deal with those as if they are big threats that we have to identify in a threat model. Those are already low-hanging fruits. And if they are not part of your requirements, as they well should by this, this step, then uh, at least you can use some day-to-day -to -day tools to take those out of the way and say, okay, I already dealt with those. You don't really need to go there and put your time and invest your energy into figuring these things out. We can go one step up, we can start looking at uh, 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 business processes or how the different parts talk to each other. We don't have to deal with that day-to-day -day stuff. And actually, this, is, this one is not mine, this is by Vandana, uh, presenting about uh, PyTM. So just if you want to hear a bit more about our approach. In the end, you have to document this stuff. Because if you don't document, it didn't happen. And <laughs> that's one of those simple sentences that goes a long way. 
because when when systems are being developed, there seems to be a tendency at some point to build tribal knowledge, things that some developers know very well about and that become part of the system, may not be touched for a while, and they're not really documented because they just work and people know about them. But as we know, the nature of findings and vulnerabilities and exploits and stuff like that is that even an application that's 38 years old will have new vulnerabilities just because people figured out new ways of attacking it, right? So having that tribal knowledge is a danger. But the moment you start documenting everything, even if you don't refer to it every day, but you keep it written somewhere that's accessible, somewhere that people know that if they need, they will be able to find it. You should be doing it. Realize that threat models are living documents. If only for the fact that, yes, you identified some finding today, if you manage to get it mitigated, then it should, if not get out of the threat model as a finding, at least be documented as solved, mitigated, right? So the reason why you would keep it there as mitigated is that in the next interaction, you, you don't want to think about the same thing again, so you know that that thing has been taken care of. But realize that by being a living document, threat models should be stored, should be available in places that people know where to find them and people know how to relate and change them. Threat models have more uses than baking soda. It's awesome. You can use them as the start for the next round. You can use them to define security contracts. And when you are talking about uh, uh, the organizational level, when you're talking about teams independently doing threat models and somebody consolidating the findings, that's extremely important. Why? Because that's where you're going to document the agreements or disagreements between those different parts of the system where one part says, I'm going to send data to you, and you know what? I'm going to sanitize it. You don't have to worry about it because you have to work faster than I have, so I'm going to take that load on me. Those security contracts get documented when you cross threat models. I'm expecting data from an uncontrolled source. I would like it to be sanitized, and I would like to have some guarantee that it's being sanitized. The same way you can create shared security responsibilities. One of the things that I liked uh, the most the first time that I saw the uh, AWS shared responsibility model was that it, it drew very clear boundaries of who was responsible for what. So if I'm a developer, I'm writing a business system and I don't have to worry about hardening the operating system that thing is going to run on because that's somebody else's problem and they know it's their problem and it's written somewhere that it's their problem and we both know that they are going to do it. That already takes a, a lot of load out of me, or at least it should. So doing that threat model and agreeing on those things at that level is a great opportunity. Finding commonalities for platforming. If you find that you have the same problem in different places, different threat models popping up the same issues, and you have an opportunity to solve that in one bank by changing a library, by writing a library, by changing the design, but in a very defined operation, you can solve both sides of the equation. You just found a way to platform that solution. Again, threat models that you can compare, threat models that you can link to each other are going to give you that visibility. And at the end, aggregate and distribute common knowledge, things that everybody knows about the system. Now you have a place where they are actually written. And uh, I don't have a presentation for this, so if anybody's looking for a, a theme, go for it. <clears throat> on the importance of templates. I've talked about documenting a lot. I talked about storing this stuff, the, this findings in, uh, in one place a lot. But I find that templates are <laughs> extremely useful for one major reason, which is security people and burnout go hand in hand. If you have one security person and they have to look at 10 different threat models, and the same kind of information, the same class of information, is in a different place, written in a different way on each one of them. For that person, that's a lot of context switching. They have to move from one format to another, understand the structure of one document again and again and again. That's burning a lot of power that they could be using to actually looking at the content of the threat model and understanding how good or bad things are. 
it's much easier to correlate those models and find those correspondences, those, those contracts, if everything looks the same. If you can compare one data dictionary with another, if you can compare a list of data flows with another, by putting documents side by side, it's going to make everybody's life much easier. If you enforce a template, people will always find the same kind of information in the same place. And bringing somebody new up to speed is going to be extremely uh, easy, especially in places where people move from team to team. If I'm on team A and I did a threat model there, participated in a threat model exercise there, and I know how things happen there, or at least how they are written in there, and I go to team B, and I have at least the amount of commonality that I need to put things or to find things in the same place, it's already a huge win from the point of view of acquiring that information or, or using that information. What I just said. And uh, I don't have a presentation for that, but the many tools that we have out there for threat modeling, like PyTM, ThreatBook, TreeAgile, and ThreatAware, they offer some templates that uh, I, I found very useful. So it's a, a great place to go and take a look. Now, sometimes this stuff, as I said, fails horribly. And uh, one of the main things that I found is that, hey, we, we are security people. We are not PMs, we are not TPMs. And those people, you know, like most talented people, they, they, they do things in different ways and uh, we get to enjoy the results. So if you find out that you are not a program person, then by all means turn, turn to one of them and uh, get their help as early as you can. Again, if you see that it doesn't bring value, something is wrong at the root level and you have to step back and check what it is. Meaning, you don't have a, an overall security uh, posture improvement. Things don't get better over time. Or you suffer from the hero threat modeler anti-pattern. That's another one identified in the threat modeling manifesto. And it's basically talking about the one guy, the one person who knows how to threat model in an organization or in a team. You don't want that. If you have that superhero that they are the only person, the only, the only people who are responsible or capable to threat model, you've got a huge problem. You want everybody to be able to do this thing. Admiration for the problem, again, in this slide, everything that's in, in quotes comes from the Threat Modeling Manifesto. And admiration for the problem is just, oh my God, I have to Threat Model. I don't know what to do, but I have to Threat Model, but I don't know how to, to do it. But I have to Threat Model, but I don't know what to do with it. And you end up looking so much at that challenge of having to do a Threat Model that you end up not having a Threat Model at all. So try to avoid that as much as you can. If your findings don't express threats, they mostly express, yeah, stuff that we thought could be a threat, but you know what, we already took care of it and there's nothing new, there's nothing interesting in here. If, I'm not saying, of course, about one single instance, but if over time you see that you are not identifying any threats, two things may be happening. You have the perfect system and body of developers, or you're not looking the right way. I'll let you decide which one is more likely. The right threats. Sometimes we have the tendency to overfocus, meaning you just opened, I don't know which vehicle of information you like the most, and you read about this amazing new vulnerability. It's the craziest thing you ever saw. It's side channel attack on multiple processors running in a very specific configuration. And you decide that that's the one that interests you and you don't go looking for all the injection that you might be susceptible to. So are you finding threats? Definitely. Are you finding the right ones, the ones that are actionable, and the ones that actually are a risk to you and your system? Not really. So a tendency to overfocus on the wrong thing will channel the work and the time and the, the energy to the wrong place and keep you away from findings that actually are useful. If you end up with a threat model that does not represent your system, I don't have to say anything. You can already imagine, not much value there. There's no perfect representation. There's not one single way to represent one given system. It's just the way it is. And dead threat models, which is the opposite of living documents, which is getting your threat as a threat model, putting it in the drawer and forgetting about it. 
The last one, your threat model is not my threat model. I personally think that that's the most interesting one, which is the organization has this idea of what the risks are. The low, not lower levels, the more granular levels have a different idea and they don't agree. You end up with a threat model that is a great threat model, just doesn't represent those things that the organization is ready to do something about. No, we won't be threat modeling. That's the one where I speak about this in more detail. So just to finish things real quick, because I am running out of time. You have a sales job in, oh, in convincing people to work with you. And the points are that, first of all, you have to tailor the pitch. You have to speak their language. You have to avoid uh, doom and gloom. I'm not going to read each one of the, the things, but basically what you have to do is convince them that this process works for them as much as it works for you. And when I say them, I mean the whole organization, not only the developers. Management, QA, QE, whatever you call them. You have to show that this program, this, the advantages that come from this program go to everyone. Uh, the important one in this, in this slide, I think it's there in the middle. Clarify that the threat modeling is an evolutionary activity. It's not a one and done, and it will get be uh, better as you keep doing it. Takeaways that I hope that you take from here. You can make it work, and measuring helps. It's all about understanding your customer, the people that you are relating to, not the customer of your business, your customer, the people who are actually affecting your, pro your program. Set expectations, don't expect perfection. It's an evolutionary thing. It's going to, to get better. Having a bad threat model is better than not having a threat model because now you have a place to start from. And use it as a verb. Don't say, bring me a threat model. Say, let's threat model this thing. It leads to better outcomes. And you want curious people. Let them be curious and hope that they are as curious as you need them to be. We run out of time. If you have questions, the Threat Modeling Connect uh, uh, community is a great place to ask them. And uh, you can see them in the vendor's hall, but uh, a lot of people are in there that know what they're talking about and have interesting things to, to say. Thank you. Couple of um, <clears throat> resources in there, and uh, if anybody wants uh, PyTM stickers, I got a bunch, just let me know. Do we have any time for questions? I don't... No, we don't, unfortunately. <laughs> we, yeah, we are over one minute over. I should have, have spoken um, faster. But you guys can bring the hey, catch me, catch me outside. Uh, off the stage, off the stage, please, um, because we are, it's time for the next talk. Thank you.